myself. <laughs> That's helpful if I mute myself first. Yeah, it's lovely to be with you, so to speak, this evening, certainly on screen and to be able to share with you again. And uh, yeah, it's uh, hopefully not too long before we're getting back more to normal, of course. And to, I, I no noticed after I prepared this that the next two uh, occasions where I'm due to speak with you, uh, that's a week on Sunday and the following sun and the Sunday after that, uh, I'm down to do the Last Supper and the Cross. Well, I'm actually going in between those tonight and going to look at Luke chapter 22 so, uh, and 23. So if you want to turn to Luke 22 and 23 in your Bible or on your app, while I just briefly uh, put it in context that we have the Last Supper earlier in chapter 22. And then Jesus and his disciples go to Gethsemane where Jesus prayed and his disciples fell asleep. And then he was betrayed by Judas. He's then tried in the first of several trials, uh, six or seven, depending on how you count them, tried um, while at the same time Peter is sort of lurking around and, and we see Peter denied him. And then uh, in chapter 23, after further trials with Pilate and Herod, he is finally led out to be crucified. So I'm going to read from Luke chapter 22, verse 63, through to chapter 23, verse 25. So Luke 22, 63, the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both of the chief, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. 
Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. So that's God's word, of course. Now, the story was told a few years ago, I heard this story about how a big lump of something, a stone supposedly, lay for centuries in a shallow brook in North Carolina. And passers-by took no notice of this, this big lump, this big stone. It was only an ugly lump. So they passed on. But one day, a poor man passing along saw not an ugly lump, but a heavy lump, a good thing to hold his door ajar if he needed to. And so he took it home. But one day, shortly after, a geologist was passing by, spotted this big lump, this ugly lump, this heavy lump that was holding the door open. And he was actually amazed because it turned out to be the biggest lump of gold ever found east of the Rockies. So it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Whether it was an ugly lump or a heavy lump or actually a golden lump, a matter of perspective and a matter of understanding. And here we're going to see the perspective that different groups of people had about Jesus. And we're going to see that they saw him either as an ugly lump or a heavy lump. So we've got the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council. We've got Pilate, we've got Herod, and then we've got the crowd. So first of all, we've got the Sanhedrin and they rejected him as an ugly lump for religious reasons. He didn't fit their concept of Messiah. They thought the Messiah was coming at this coming or his first coming. They, they didn't see a second coming. They saw him as coming to redeem Israel and free them from Roman rule and to set them up as the head of the nations. And one day that will be the case. But they failed to see from the Old Testament scriptures the suffering Messiah that he also was and was to be on this first coming. And so they rejected him, mocking him and ridiculing him and treating him with contempt. So much so that they were so determined to get rid of him that they lied to Pilate. They lied about the, the allegation that he'd, he'd um, it was forbidding people to pay taxes to Caesar. They tried to get him to say that a few chapters earlier, but he said, no, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In other words, pay your taxes. And, and it's staggering sometimes what lies people will tell about Christianity and about Christian about Christ to avoid belief. No, they had their predetermined idea of what the Christ would be like. And they were sticking to that. They were basically making Christ in their image, the Christ they wanted, the Christ they, they thought he should be, rather than accepting him as the Christ that he was. And we have to be aware of that danger, because even as Christians, we can do that. We can try and take the bits about him that we like best, his grace and his mercy and, and all these things, and his forgiveness. Uh, and sort of brush under the carpet certain aspects we maybe don't like so much, his judgment, maybe sometimes his holiness, and so on. So we mustn't 
reject the real Messiah in that sense because he doesn't fit our preconceived religious ideas. But we must accept him as he is and love him as he is. G.K. Chesterton, the author, uh, wrote, let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. And that's it, isn't it? Loving him for who he is. Then there's Pilate. If the Sanhedrin rejected him as an ugly lump for religious reasons, Pilate rejected him as a heavy lump for political reasons. Three times he declared that Jesus was innocent in chapter 23. And yet he still allowed him to be crucified. He politely rejected Jesus by not accepting him as king and God. As far as he was concerned, Caesar was Lord. That was what you had to pledge if you were a Roman citizen. And here, at the end of the day, he's more concerned with maintaining the peace. He's more concerned with being political rather than with justice. And again, we, we've got to be wary there that we don't put political correctness above the truth of God's word. And there is growing pressure in our society for us to do that. There is growing pressure for us to go with what is politically correct to keep the peace rather than risk offending people by lovingly and graciously standing by and declaring the truth of God's word and valuing as a lump of gold, a gold nugget, if you like, or rather I should say more precious than gold, the Lord Jesus, who is the word of God and his written word. Well, then we've got Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee, and he rejected Jesus as an ugly lump for reasons of pride. You see, he thought it's great. I've got Jesus here. He's captive and he can perform for me. He can perform a sign. He can do miracles. I've heard about all the miracles he's done. But Jesus doesn't perform for him. In fact, Jesus doesn't even say a word. And he's not happy about this. So he turns to ridiculing him and mocking him. And at the end of the day, he's like so many people, I guess, like mankind generally. Because so many, and, and we were like this at one time before we were Christians, are too proud. So many are too proud to yield to his rule. Because they don't value him as more precious than gold. They just see him as an ugly lump who is somebody who expects them to give up their independence and their Freedom to sin, I guess, to actually yield to him and depend on him. John Blanchard, the author and evangelist, said this pride is a denial of dependence upon God. Pride causes us to want to be independent of God. And so we've got to be aware of the danger of pride, especially when the Lord doesn't perform miracles for us or doesn't perform for us. You know, when we, we pray for a healing and he doesn't give us a healing or maybe not when we want it or we pray for other things and he doesn't give it us what we want when we want. He's not there to perform for us, but he's there for us to adore and worship as more precious than gold and to yield to him and accept that his way is best. And we find that difficult, don't we? Because we don't want to wait for a healing. We don't want to wait for a miracle. We don't want to wait and, and maybe find that actually it's not going to happen in this life. The ultimate healing for us is going to be when we go home to glory. And so we've got to beware there. And then we've got the crowd. They rejected him as an ugly lump. Why? Because they were manipulated. They were coerced by the religious leaders 
into shouting for him to be crucified. They just refused his rule. They wanted to be rid of him. They didn't care about the consequences of their sin. In fact, they said, his blood be on us and on our children, as one of the other Gospels records. And the crowd here will have anyone, anything but Jesus. They'll have a murderer rather than Jesus. And, you know, people who follow other religions, including atheism, they'll have anything, anyone other than Jesus as the son of God, the king, the messiah. Those who will seek spirituality, but they'll seek it in the direction of the occult and dark practices rather than seek Jesus. The media will proclaim and glorify all sorts of things rather than Jesus. And what tends to happen sometimes is they will shout down those who proclaim the Lord Jesus and proclaim his word with no platforming and cancelling and trolling and abusing and, and just just basically trying to shout loudest because they don't like what God says. They doubt them and their sin. And we've got to beware of the danger of being intimidated and silenced by the shrill voices of the crowd. It's not easy to go against the crowd. It's not easy to be in the minority unless we value him as more precious than gold. Rick Warren, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life, said this, or wrote this in the book, actually. Unfortunately, those who follow the crowd usually get lost in it. Now, the disciples are nowhere to be seen in the passage that I've read. They'd abandoned him. And Peter denied him, of course. They didn't reject him, of course, apart from Judas. But they abandoned him as a heavy lump. It seemed like they were happy to have him when it was convenient. But it's not very convenient now when they could be at risk of losing their lives as well. And so they don't seem to be following him very closely at this point. And yet just a few weeks later, on the day of Pentecost, they're standing up boldly proclaiming the risen Christ and telling the crowd they need to repent of their sin. What a change. Because the Spirit is living in them. And when we're filled with the Spirit, like they were, we're strengthened to stand for him. So the challenge for us this evening is this. Will we abandon him as a heavy lump when it's not convenient to follow him and stand for him? Or will we stand for him, valuing him as more precious than gold? May God bless his word. So over to